Chapter 19 When Sylvie returned from Storsenda, she had Flora with her. Khan's sister greeted him embarrassedly. Sylvie led both of them out of the crowd and over to the edge of the excavation. "'Go ahead, Flora,' she urged. "'Make up with Khan. It won't be any harder than making up with Wade was.' "'How did that happen, by the way?' Khan asked. "'Your girlfriend,' Flora said. "'She came to the house and practically forced me into a car and flew me into Storsenda, and then made me keep quiet and listen while Wade told me the truth. "'I wasn't completely sure what the truth was myself till Wade opened up,' Sylvie admitted. "'I had a pretty good idea, though.' "'I always hated that Merlin thing,' Flora burst out. All those old men in Fozzie's office, dreaming about the wonderful things Merlin was going to do, with everything crumbling around them and everybody getting poorer every day, and doing nothing, nothing. And when you were coming home, I was expecting you to tell them there was no Merlin and go to work and do something for yourselves. But you didn't, and I couldn't see what you were trying to do. And then, when Wade joined you and father... I thought he was either helping you to put over some kind of a swindle, or else he'd started believing in Merlin himself. I should have seen what you were trying to do from the beginning. At least, from when you talked them into cleaning the town up, and fixing the escalators, and getting the fountains going again. So the fountains weren't dusty any more. How's Mother taking things now? Flora looked distressed. She goes around wringing her hands. Honestly, I never saw anybody doing that outside a soap opera. Half the time she thinks you and father are a pair of unprincipled scoundrels, and the other half she thinks you're going to let Merlin destroy the world. I'm beginning to be afraid of something like that myself. Huh? But Merlin's just a big fake, isn't it? You are using it to make these people do something they wouldn't do for themselves, aren't you? It started that way. What do you think all this is about? he asked, gesturing toward the excavation and the two giant mining machines, digging and blasting and pounding away at the rock. Well, to keep Kurt Fozzie and that crowd happy, I suppose. It seems like an awful waste of time, though. I'm afraid it isn't. I'm afraid Merlin, or something just as bad, is down there. That's why I'm here instead of on Koshai. I want to keep people like Fozzie from doing anything foolish with it when they find it. But there can't be a Merlin. I'm afraid there is. Not the sort of a Merlin Fozzie expects to find. That thing's too small for that. But there is something down there. The question of size bothered him. That drum-shaped superstructure couldn't even hold the personnel record machine they had found here, or the computers at Storsenda Stock Exchange. It could have been an intelligence evaluator, or an enemy intentions predictor. But it seemed small even for that. It would be something like a computer. That was as far as he was able to go and it could be something completely outside the reach of his imagination. At the back of his mind, the suspicion grew that Carl Liebert knew exactly what it was, and he became more and more convinced that he had seen the self-styled preacher before. Finally, the whole top of the hundred-foot collapsium-covered structure was uncovered and the excavation had been leveled out wide enough to accommodate all the massive paraphernalia of the collapsium cutter. They put the thing onto contragravity again and brought her down in place. The work of lifting off the reactor and the converter and the rest of it, piece by piece, began. Finally, everything was set up. A dozen and a half of them were gathered in the room that had become their meeting place after dinner. They were all too tired to start the cutting that night, and at the same time excited and anxious. They talked in disconnected snatches, and then somebody put on one of the telecast screens. A music program was just ending. There was a brief silence. 
and then a commentator appeared, identifying his news service. He spoke rapidly and breathlessly, his professional gravity cracking all over. "'The hypership city of Asgard from Aton has just come into telecast range,' he began. "'We have received an exclusive interworld news service story recently brought to Aton on the Pan-Federation spaceline ship Magellanic from Terra. News of revived interest in the Third Force computer, Merlin, having reached Terra by way of Odin. Representatives of interworld news, to which this service subscribes, interviewed retired Force General Fox Travis, now living at the advanced age of a hundred and fourteen on Luna. General Travis, who commanded the Third Fleet Army Force here during the war, categorically denied that there had ever existed any supercomputer of the sort. We bring you now a recorded interview with General Travis, made on Luna." For an instant Khan felt the room around him whirling dizzily, and then he caught hold of himself. Everybody else was shouting in sudden consternation, and then everybody was hushing everybody else and making twice as much noise. The screen flickered. The commentator vanished, and instead, seated in the deep cushioned chair, was the thin and frail old man with whom Khan had talked two years before, and through an open segment of dome roof behind him the full earth shone, the contents of the western hemisphere plainly distinguishable. A young woman in starchy nurse's white bent forward solicitously from beside the chair, handing him a small beaker from which he sipped some stimulant. He looked much as he had when Khan talked to him. But there was something missing. Oh, yes, the comparative youngster of seventy-some. Mike Shanley, my aide-de-camp on Poitem. Now he thinks he's my keeper. He wasn't in evidence, and he should be. Then Khan knew where and when he had seen the man who claimed to be a preacher named Carl Liebert. "'There is absolutely no truth in it, gentlemen,' Travis was saying. "'There never was any such computer. I only wish there had been. It would have shortened the war by years. We did, of course, use computers of all sorts, but they were all the conventional types used by business organizations.' The rest was lost in a new outburst of shouting. General Travis, in the screen, continued in dumb show. The only thing Khan could distinguish was Liebert's Shanley's voice, screaming, "'Can it be a lie? Is there no great computer?' Then Kurt Fawzi was pounding on the top of the desk and bellowing, "'Shut up! Listen!' "'Frankly, I'm surprised,' Travis was continuing. "'Young Maxwell talked to me, here, in this room, a couple of years ago.' I told him then that nothing of the sort existed. If he's back on Poitem telling people there is, he's lying to them and taking advantage of their credulity. There never was anything called Project Merlin." "'Ha! Who's a liar now?' Clemzerev shouted. "'Dolph, what did your people find in the library?' "'Why, that's right!' Professor Kelton exclaimed. My students did find a dozen references to Project Merlin. He couldn't be ignorant of anything like that. "'This youth has been lying to us all along,' the old man with the beard cried, pointing an accusing finger at Khan. "'He has created false hopes. He has given us faith in a delusion. Why, he is the wickedest monster in human history!' "'Well, thank you, General Travis.' another voice from the screen-speaker was saying, the only calm voice in the room, "'That was a most excellent statement, sir. It should—' "'Con, you didn't tell us you'd talk to General Travis,' Morgan Gatworth was saying. "'Why didn't you?' "'Because I never believed anything he told me. You were in Kurt Fawzi's office the day I came home.' You know how shocked everybody was when I told you I hadn't been able to learn anything positive. Why should I repeat his lies and discourage everybody that much more? Why, he'd deny there was a Merlin if he was sitting on top of it, Khan declared. He wants the credit for winning the war, not for letting Merlin win it for him. 
I don't blame Khan, Klemzarev said. If he'd told us that then, some of us might have believed it. And look what we found, Kurt Fawzi added, pointing at the ceiling. Is that Merlin up there, or isn't it? That little thing, Shanley cried scornfully. How could that be Merlin? I'm going to my chamber to pray for forgiveness for this wretch. He turned and started for the door. Stop him, Tom, Con said, and Tom Brangwen put himself in front of the older man, gripping his right arm. Shanley tried, briefly, to resist. Seems to me you lost faith in Merlin awfully quick, the former town marshal of Litchfield said. You knew there was a Merlin all along, and you never wanted us to find it. Franz Veltrin, who'd been Liebert's most enthusiastic adherent, had also lost faith suddenly. He was shouting vituperation at the prophet of Merlin. Knock it off, Franz. He was only doing his duty, Kahn said. Weren't you, General Shanley? It took almost a minute before they stopped yelling for an explanation and allowed him to make one. He caught Clem Zareff's comment. Must be pretty hot if they have to send a general to handle it. I talked to Travis, yes. He gave me the same story he just repeated on that interview, Kahn said, picking his way carefully between fact and fiction. After I went back to Montevideo, he and this aide of his must have been afraid I didn't believe it, which I didn't. When I was ready to graduate, I got this offer of an instructorship. That was a bribe to keep me on Terra and off Poitem. When I turned it down and took the Mazar home, Travis sent Shanley after me. He must have grown that beard and that pageboy bob on the way out. I suppose he contacted Murchison as soon as he landed. Wait a minute. He went to the communications screen and punched out a combination. A girl appeared and sing-songed, Barton Masara, Investigation and Protection. Con Maxwell here. We gave you some audio-visuals of a man with a white beard, alias Carl Liebert, he began. Just a sec, Mr. Maxwell. She spoke quickly into a handphone. The screen flickered, and she was replaced by a hard-faced young man in dark clothes. "'Hello, Mr. Maxwell. Joe Massara. We haven't found anything on Liebert yet. Are any of the officers of the Andromeda where you can contact them? Let them see those audio-visuals. I'll bet that beard was grown aboard ship coming out from Terra.' Bedlam broke out suddenly. Shanley, who had been standing passively, his right arm loosely grasped by Tom Brangwen, came down on Brangwen's instep with the heel of his left foot, and hit Brangwen under the chin with the heel of his left palm. Wrenching his arm free, he started for the door. Sylvie Jackmott snatched a chair and threw it along the floor. It hit the fleeing man's ankles and brought him down. Half a dozen men piled on top of him, and Brangwen was yelling to them not to choke him to death till he could answer some questions. "'Hey, what's going on?' the detective agency man in the screen was asking. "'Need help? We'll start a car right away.' "'Everything's under control, thank you.' Masara hesitated for a moment. "'What's the dope on this statement that was on telecast a few minutes ago?' he asked. "'Travis doesn't want us to find Merlin. What you just heard was one of his people, planted here at Force Command. We're going to question him when we have time.' but there isn't a word of truth in that statement you just heard on the Herald Guardian newscast. Merlin exists, and we've found it. We'll have it open inside of thirty hours at most. That was the line he was going to take with everybody. As soon as he had Masara off the screen, he was punching the combination of his father's private screen at Interplanetary Building. It took five interminable minutes before Rodney Maxwell came on. He could hear Clem Zareff shouting orders into one of the inside communication screens. General turnout, everything on combat ready, guards to come at once to the office. How close are you to digging that thing out? his father asked as soon as he appeared. We're down to it. We can start cutting the collapsium any time now. Start cutting it ten minutes ago, his father told him. 
and don't leave Force Command till you have it open. How many men and vehicles does Clem have for defense? You'll need all of them in a couple of hours. Everybody here is stunned now. They'll come out of it inside an hour, and they'll come out fighting. You'd better come out here. He turned, saw Jerry Rivas helping hold Shanley in a chair, and shouted to him, Jerry, turn out the workmen. Start cutting the can open right away. He turned back to his father. Clem's just ordered all his force out. Are you coming here? I can't. In about an hour, everything's going up with a bang. I have to be here to grab a few of the pieces. You'll do a lot of good in jail, or on the end of a rope. Chance I have to take, his father replied. I think I'll have a couple of hours. If anybody from the press calls you, what are you going to tell them? Khan repeated the line he had taken already. His father nodded. All right, I'll call you later, if I can. Just keep things going at your end. A dozen of Clem Zareff's men were crowding into the room. This man's under close arrest, the old soldier was telling them. He is very important and very dangerous. Take him out somewhere, search him to the skin, take his clothes away from him and give him a robe. He's to be watched every second. Make sure he hasn't poison or other suicide means. He's to be questioned later. As soon as Rodney Maxwell was off the screen, there was a call signal. It was one of the news services, wanting a statement. "'I'll take it,' Gatworth said, and began talking. "'This statement of General Travis's is completely false. There is a Merlin, and we've found it. They found something that might be good enough, Merlin, for the next thirty hours. That superstructure was just big enough for the manually operated parts of a computer like Merlin, the input and output, and the programming machines. Chapter 20 Clem Zareff's guardsmen were mercenaries. A little over a year ago they had, at best, been homeless drifters, and not a few had been outlaws. Now they were soldiers, well-fed, clothed, quartered, and equipped, and well and regularly paid. They had a good thing. They were willing to fight to keep it, Merlin or no Merlin. Khan left them to their commander. He did gather the workmen for a short harangue, but that wasn't really necessary. They had a good thing, too, and most of them realized that they were working toward a better thing. They could be depended upon, too. They came crowding out and manned lifters. They got the heavy collapsium cutter maneuvered into place and the shielding down around the cutting head. After that, there were only four men who could work, each in his own heavily shielded cabin. In spite of the shielding that covered the actual work, there was an awesome display of multicolored light. It was like being in the middle of an aurora borealis. What was going on where that tiny rotating beam of cosmic rays was grinding at the collapsium simply couldn't have been imagined. Khan would have liked to stay outside. He could not. Too many things were happening in too many places, and it was all coming in by screen. Rioting had broken out in Storsenda and a dozen other places. He saw, on a news screen, a mob raging in front of the executive palace. Yellow-shirted cybernarchists were battling with city police and planetary troops. Armageddonists and human supremacy leaguers were fighting both and one another. Above all the confused noise of shouting and shooting, an amplifier was braying, "'It's a lie! It's a lie! Merlin has been found!' Newsmen began arriving. Zareff's men had orders to pass them through the cordon that had been put up around Force Command." and they took up his time. It was worth it, though. They could tell him what was going on. J. Fitzwilliam Sturber called. Rodney Maxwell had been arrested, on a farrago of fraud charges. I don't know who he's supposed to have defrauded. The planetary government is the sole complainant. And bail was being illegally denied. Sturber's lawyerly soul was outraged, but he was grimly elated. You wait till things quiet down a little. We're going to start a false arrest suit. If you're alive to. 
Apparently Sturber hadn't thought of that. What do you think's going to happen when the stock exchange opens? It's going to be bad. But don't worry. Your father must have foreseen something like this. He gave me instructions, and instructed a few more people. He named some of the Tri-System Investments people and some of the bankers. We're going to try and brace the market as long as we can. Nobody who keeps his head is going to lose anything in the long run." Luther Chen Wong called from Port Carpenter on Koshai. He and Clyde Nichols and a young mathematics professor named Simon McQuart had been running the colony in Khan's absence, and since Eve's Jackmont had gone to space in the Ouroboros too. "'Well, they caught up with you,' he said. Evidently he had figured out what the search for Merlin was all about, too. "'What do we do about it?' "'Well, we are just before finding Merlin here. I hope we find it before things get too bad.' He told Luther the situation of the moment. "'Have you people started on another hypership yet?' "'We're getting organized, too. I don't suppose it's advisable to send any more ships into Storsenda for a while. Are you sure this thing you found is Merlin?' "'I don't know what it is. It's only big enough for the apparatus they need to operate a thing like Merlin.' "'Yes, Luther, I'm sure we have found Merlin.' Chen Wang looked at him curiously. "'I hope so. I can't think of anything else that can stop this business.' Tom Brangwen was in the room when he turned from the screen. "'We searched Liebert's Shanley's rooms,' he said. "'We found a bomb.' "'What kind of bomb?' "'Vest pocket thermonuclear. He seems to have gotten the fissionables by taking apart a couple of light tactical missiles. The whole thing's packed inside a hundred-pound power cartridge case. It was in a traveling bag under his bed. And you know how it was to be fired? With a regular forty-millimeter flare pistol welded into the end of the bomb. The flare powder had been taken out of the cartridge, and it had been reloaded with a big charge of rifle powder. I suppose it would blow one subcritical mass into another, but the only way he could have fired the bomb would have been by pulling the trigger and blowing himself up along with it. He must have wanted Merlin destroyed pretty badly. "'Have you questioned him yet?' "'Not yet. I wanted to tell you about it first. He looked at his watch. Only four hours had passed since the newscast. Why, that seemed like months ago now. "'All right, Tom. We'll go talk to him. Where's the colonel?' Zareff was surrounded by a dozen screens keeping in touch with the Lester Dawes and the gunboats and combat cars, and the gun positions with which he had ringed Force Command. It was only a little army, maybe, but he was a busy commander-in-chief. "'You take care of it. Tell me what you get from him. I can't leave now. There's a report of a number of aircraft approaching from the west now.' They found Judge Ledoux and Kurt Fawzi and Dolph Kelton who were just sitting around, wishing there was something to do to help. They gave Franz Veltrin and Sylvie Jackmont the job of keeping the representatives of the press amused. Then they went down to the room in which General Mike Shanley was held under guard. Shanley, wearing a bathrobe and nothing else, was lying on a cot, sleeping peacefully. Three of Zareff's men were sitting on chairs, watching him narrowly. All right, you can go, Con told them. We'll take care of him. Shanley woke instantly. He sat up and swung his legs over the edge of the cot. You can have my name and rank, he said, and his voice no longer quavered. My serial number is, he receded a string of figures, and that's all you're getting out of me. We'll get anything we want out of you, Con told him. You know what a mind probe is? You should. Your accomplices used one on my father's secretary. She's a hopeless imbecile now. You'll be, too, when we're through with you. But before then, you'll have given us everything you know." Kelton began to protest. "'Con, you can't do a thing like that.' "'A mind-probe is utterly illegal. Why, it's a capital offense!' Ledoux exclaimed. 
Con, I forbid you! Judge, don't make me call those guards and have you removed, Con said. You can stop bluffing, Shanley told him. Where would you get a mind probe? Out of the chief of intelligence's office, here in his headquarters. I should imagine it was to be used in interrogating Alliance prisoners during the war. I think Colonel Zareff would enjoy helping to use it on you. He used to be an Alliance officer. Shanley was silent. Khan sat down in one of the chairs at the small table. General Shanley, would you describe General Fox Travis as a man of honor and integrity? And would you so describe yourself? Shanley said nothing. Yet both of you have lied, deliberately and repeatedly, to conceal the existence of Merlin. And we found that bomb in your room. You were willing to blow up this headquarters, and everybody, yourself included, in it, to keep us from getting at Merlin. Well, you know that we can make you tell us the truth, maybe when it's too late, and you know that we are going to get Merlin. We're cutting the collapsium off that thing above now. Shanley laughed. You're supposed to be a computer man. You think that little thing could be Merlin? The controls and programming machine for Merlin. He turned to Kurt Fozzie. You always claimed that Merlin was here in Force Command. You had it backward. Force Command is inside Merlin. What do you mean, Con? The walls, the fifty-foot walls, shielded inside and out. Merlin, the circuitry, the memory bank, the relays, everything was installed inside them. What's up above is only what we needed to operate the computer. Isn't that true, General? Shanley had stopped his derisive laughter. He sat on the edge of the cot, tensing as though for a leap at Khan's throat. That won't help, either. If you try it, we won't shoot you. We'll just overpower you and start mind-probing right away. Now, you feel that suppressing Merlin was worth any sacrifice. We're not unreasonable, if you can convince us that Merlin ought not to be brought to light. Well, you can't do any harm by talking, and you may do some good. You may even accomplish your mission. He can't talk us out of it, Kurt Fozzie seemed determined to spoil things by saying. Con, I'm coming around to Clem's way of thinking. They just don't want anybody else to have it. No, we don't. Shanley said. We don't want the whole Federation breaking up into bloody anarchy, and that's what'll happen if you dig that thing up and put it into operation. Nobody said anything except Fozzie, who began an indignant contradiction and then subsided. Tom Brangwen lit a cigarette. Would you mind letting me have one of those? Shanley said. I haven't had a smoke since I came here. It wouldn't have been in character. Brangwen took one out of the pack, lit it at the tip of his own, and gave it to Shanley with his left hand, his right ready to strike. Shanley laughed in real amusement. "'Oh, brother!' he reproved in his former pious tones. "'You distrust your fellow man. That is a sin!' He rose slowly, the bathrobe flapping at his bare shins, and sat down across the table from Khan. All right, he said. I'll tell you about it. I'll tell you the truth, which will be something of a novelty all around. Shanley puffed for a moment at the cigarette. It must really have tasted good after his long abstinence. You know, we were really caught off balance when the war ended. It even caught Merlin short. Information lag, of course. The whole alliance caved in all at once. Well... We fed Merlin all the data available, and analyzed the situation. Then we did something we really weren't called upon to do, because that was policy planning and wasn't our province. But we were going to move an occupation army into System State's planets, and we didn't want to do anything that would embarrass the Federation government later. We fed Merlin every scrap of available information on political and economic conditions everywhere in the Federation 
and set up a long-term computation of the general effects of the war. The extrapolation was supposed to run five hundred years in the future. It didn't. It stopped, at a point a trifle over two hundred years from now, with a statement that no computation could be made further, because at that point the Terran Federation would no longer exist. The others, who had taken chairs facing him, looked at him blankly. "'No more Federation?' Judge Ledoux asked incredulously. "'Why, the Federation! The Federation!' The Federation would last forever. Anybody knew that. There just couldn't be no more Federation. "'That's right,' Shanley said. We had trouble believing it, too. Remember, we were Federation officers. The Federation was our religion, just like patriotism used to be, back in the days of nationalism. We checked for error. We made detailed analysis. We ran it all over again. It was no use. In two hundred years there won't be any Terran Federation. The government will collapse slowly. The Space Navy will disintegrate. Planets and systems will lose touch with Terra and with one another. You know what it was like here, just before the war. It will be like that on every planet, even on Terra. Just a slow crumbling, till everything is gone. Then every planet will start sliding back, in isolation, into barbarism. Merlin predicted that? Kurt Fawzi asked, shocked. If Merlin said so, it had to be true. Shanley nodded. So we ran another computation. We added the data of publication of this prognosis. You know, Merlin can't predict what you or I would do under given circumstances. But Merlin can handle large group behavior with absolute accuracy. If we made public Merlin's prognosis, the end would come but not in two centuries, but in less than one. And it wouldn't be a slow, peaceful decay. It would be a bomb-type reaction. Rebellions, overthrow of Federation authority, and then revolt and counter-revolt against planetary authority. Division along sectional or class lines on individual planets. Interplanetary wars, what we fought the Alliance to prevent. Left in ignorance of the future, people would go on trying to make do with what they had. But if they found out that the Federation was doomed, everybody would be trying to snatch what they could, and end by smashing everything. Left in ignorance, there might be a planet here and there that would keep enough of the old civilization to serve, in five or so centuries, as a nucleus for a new one. Informed in advance of the doom of the Federation, they would all go down together in the same bloody shambles, and there would be a galactic night of barbarism for no one knows how many thousand years. "'We don't want anything like that to happen,' Tom Brangwen said, in a frightened voice. "'Then pull everybody out of here and blow the place up, Merlin along with it,' Shanley said. "'No, we'll not do that,' Fawzi shouted. "'I'll shoot the man dead who tries it!' Why didn't you people blow Merlin up? Con asked. We built it. We'd worked with it. It was part of us, and we were part of it. We couldn't. Besides, there was a chance that it might survive the Federation. When a new civilization arose, it would be useful. We just sealed it. There were fewer than a hundred of us who knew about it. We all took an oath of secrecy. We spent the rest of our lives trying to suppress any mention of Merlin or the Merlin Project. You have no idea how shocked both General Travis and I were when you told us that the story was still current here on Poitem. And when we found out that you'd been getting into the records of the Third Force, I took the next ship I could, a miserable little freighter, and when I landed and found out what was happening, I contacted Murchison and scared the life out of him with stories about a secessionist conspiracy. All this Armageddonist human supremacy, Merlin as the devil stuff that's been going on, was started by Murchison. And he succeeded in scaring Vykoven with the cybernarchists, too. 
This computation on the future of the Federation is still in the backwork file? Khan asked. Shanley nodded. We were criminally reckless, I can see that now. Let me beg, again, that you destroy the whole thing. We'll have to talk it over among ourselves, Judge Ledoux said. The five of us here cannot presume to speak for everybody. We will, of course, have to keep you confined. I hope you will understand we cannot accept your parole. Is there anything you want in the meantime? Khan asked. I would like something to smoke, and some clothes, General Shanley said, and a shave and a haircut. Chapter 21 all through the night a shifting blaze of many-colored light rose and dimmed the stars above the mesa. They stared in awe, marveling at the energy that was pouring out of the converters into a tiny spot that inched its way around the collapsium shielding. It must have been visible for hundreds of miles. It was, for there was a new flood of rumors circulating in Storsenda and repeated and denied by the newscasts, now running continuously. Merlin had been found. Merlin had been blown up by government troops. Merlin was being transported to Storsenda to be installed as arbiter of the government. Merlin the monster was destroying the planet. Merlin the devil was unchained. Khan and Kurt Fawzi and Dolph Kelton and Judge Ledoux and Tom Brangwen clustered together, talking in whispers. They had told nobody yet of the interview with Shanley. "'You think it would make all that trouble?' Kelton was asking anxiously, hoping that the others would convince him that it wouldn't. "'Maybe we had better destroy it,' Judge Ledoux faltered. "'You see what it's done already. The whole planet's in anarchy. If we let this go on—' "'We can't decide anything like that, just the five of us,' Brangwen was insisting. "'We'll have to get the others together and see what they think.' We have no right to make any decision like this for them. They're no more able to make the decision than we are, Khan said. But we've got to. They have a right to know. If you decide to destroy Merlin, you'll have to decide to kill me first, Kurt Fawzi said, his voice deadly calm. You won't do it while I'm alive. But Kurt, Ledoux expostulated, you know why these people here at Storacenda are rioting? It's because they've lost hope, because they're afraid and desperate. The Terran Federation is something everybody feels they have to have, for peace and order and welfare. If people thought it was breaking up, they'd be desperate too. They'd do the same insane things these people here on this planet are doing. General Shanley was right. Don't destroy the hope that keeps them sane. We don't need to do that, Kurt Fawzi argued. We can use Merlin to solve our problems. We don't need to tell the whole Federation what's going to happen in two hundred years. It would get out. It couldn't help getting out, Ledoux said. Let's not try to decide it ourselves, Khan said. Let's get Merlin into operation and run a computation on it. "'You mean ask Merlin to tell us whether it ought to be destroyed or not?' Ledoux asked incredulously. "'Let Merlin put itself on trial and sentence itself to destruction?' "'Merlin is a computer. Computers deal only in facts. Computers are machines. They have no sense of self-preservation. If Merlin ought to be destroyed, Merlin will tell us so.' "'You willing to leave it up to Merlin, Kurt?' Tom Brangwen asked. Fawzi gulped. "'Yes. If Merlin says we ought to, we'll have to do it.' Toward noon, a telecast went out from Koshai on a dozen different wavelengths. Khan, half asleep in a chair in the Commander-in-Chief's office, saw Simon McQuart, the young mathematics professor from Storsenda College, who had become one of the leaders of the colony, appear on the screen. The next moment he was fully awake, shocked by McQuart's words. This is not a threat. This is a solemn, even a prayerful warning. 
we do not want to use genocidal weapons of mass destruction against the world of our birth. But whether we do or not rests solely with you. We came here with a dream of a better world, a world of happiness and plenty for all. We have been working, on Koshai, to build such a world on Poitem. Now you are smashing that dream. When it is gone, we will have nothing to live for except revenge, and we will take that revenge, make no mistake. We have the weapons with which to take it. Remember, this was a Federation naval base and naval arsenal during the war. Here the Federation Navy built their super-missiles, the missiles which devastated Ashmadai and Belphegor and Baphomet, and hundreds of these weapons are here. We have them, ready for launching. Once they are launched, with the robo-pilots set for targets on Poitem, you will have a hundred and sixty hours, at the most, to live. We will launch them immediately, if there is another attack made upon Force Command Duplicate HQ, or upon Interplanetary Building in Storsenda, or if Rodney Maxwell is killed, no matter by whom, or under what circumstances. We beg you, earnestly and prayerfully, not to force us to do this dreadful thing. We speak to each one of you, for each one of you holds the fate of the planet in his own hands." The image faded from the screen. As it did, Khan was looking from one to another of the people in the room with him. All were dumbfounded, most of them frightened. "'They wouldn't do it, would they?' Lorenzo Minardis was asking. Khan. You know these people. They wouldn't, really." "'Don't depend on it, Lorenzo,' Clem Zarev said. "'It's hard for a lot of people to shoot somebody ten feet away with a pistol. But just sending off a missile, that's nothing but setting a lot of dials and then pushing a button.' "'I'm not worrying about whether they do it or not,' Khan said. "'What I'm worrying about is how many people will believe they will.' Apparently, a good many people did. Zarev's combat vehicles began reporting a cessation of fighting. The newscasts, repeating the ultimatum from Koshai, told of fewer and fewer disorders in the city or elsewhere. By mid-afternoon, the rioting had stopped. By that time, too, Rodney Maxwell was on screen. He was, Khan noticed, wearing his pistols again. "'What happened?' he asked. They let you out on bail?" Maxwell shook his head. Charges dismissed. They didn't have anything to charge me with in the first place. But they haven't let me out yet. You're wearing your guns. Yes, but they still have me penned up here at the Executive Palace. They're practically keeping me in the safe. I wish our people on Koshai hadn't mentioned me in their ultimatum. Jake Feikhoven's afraid to let me run around loose for fear some lunatic shoots me and starts the Planet Busters coming in. Jake did one good thing, though. He ordered the stock exchange closed and declared a five-day bank holiday. By that time, you ought to have Merlin opened and working, and then the market'll be safe. Khan simply replied, I hope so. There was no telling what kind of taps there might be on the screen his father was using. He couldn't risk telling him about Shanley, or about the last computation which Merlin made. "'If we sent the Lester Dawes in, do you think you might talk them into letting you come out here?' "'I can try.' Flora arrived at Force Command that afternoon. "'I would have come sooner,' she said, "'but Mother's had a complete collapse. It happened last evening. She's in the hospital. I was with her until just an hour and a half ago.' She's still unconscious. You mean she's in danger? I don't know. They think she's all right, except for the shock. It was the Travis statement that did it. Think I ought to go to her? Flora shook her head. Just keep on with what you're doing here. There isn't anything you can do for her now. The best thing you can do for her, Con, is prove that you weren't lying about Merlin, Sylvie told him. The Lester Dawes didn't make it from Force Command to Storsenda and back until after dark, and the green and white and red and orange lights were rising in folds and waves. Rodney Maxwell had heard about his wife's condition. 
It was the first thing he spoke of when Khan and Flora and Sylvie met him as he got off the ship. "'There isn't anything we can do, father,' Flora said. "'They'll call us when there's any change.' He said the same thing Sylvie had said. "'The only thing we can do is get that infernal thing uncovered. Once we do this, everything will be all right. We'll show your mother that it wasn't a fake and it isn't anything dangerous. We'll put a stop to all these horror stories about mechanical devils and living machines.' Khan drew his father off where the girls couldn't overhear. "'This is something worse,' he said. "'This is a bomb that could blow up the whole Federation.' "'Are you going nuts, too?' his father demanded. Khan told him about Shanley. He repeated, almost word for word, the story Shanley had told. "'Do you believe that?' his father asked. "'Don't you?' You were in Storcenda when the Travis statement came out. You saw how people reacted. If this story gets out, people will be acting the same way on every planet in the Federation. Not just places like Poitem, planets like Terra and Baldur and Marduk and Odin and Osiris. It would be the end of everything civilized, everywhere. Why didn't they use Merlin to save the Federation? It's past saving. It's been past saving since before the war. The war was what gave it the final shove. If they could have used Merlin to reverse the process, they wouldn't have sealed it away. But you know, Khan, we can't destroy Merlin. If we did, the same people who went crazy over the Travis statement would go crazy all over again, worse than ever. We'd be destroying everything we planned for, and we'd be destroying ourselves." That bluff young McQuart and Luther Chen Wong and Bill Nichols made wouldn't work twice. And if they weren't bluffing... His father shuddered. And if we don't, how long do you think civilization will last here, if it blows up all over the rest of the Federation? The big machine cut on, a little spot of raw energy grinding away the collapsium, inch by inch, the undulating curtains of colored light illuminated the Badlands for miles around. Then, when the first hint of dawn came into the east, they went out. The steady roar of the generators that had battered every ear for over twenty-four hours stopped. There was unbelieving silence, and then shouts. The workmen swarmed out to man lifters. Slowly, the heavy apparatus, the reactor and the converters, the cutting machine and the shielding around it was lifted away. Finally, a lone lifter came in, and men in radiation suits went down to hook on grapples, and it lifted away, carrying with it a ten-foot square sheet of thin steel that weighed almost thirty tons. When they had battered a hole in the vitrified rock underneath, guards brought up General Shanley. Somebody, almost up to professional standards, had given him a haircut. The beard was gone, too. A Federation Army officer's uniform had been found reasonably close to his size, and somebody had even provided him with the four stars of his retirement rank. He was, again, the man Khan had seen in the dome house on Luna. "'Well, you got it open,' he said, climbing down from the air jeep that had brought him. Now, what are you going to do with it? We can't make up our minds, Khan said. We're going to let the computer tell us what to do with it. Shanley looked at him, startled. You mean, you're going to have Merlin judge itself and decide its own fate? he asked. You'll get the same result we did. They let a ladder down the hole and descended. Khan and his father... Kurt Fawzi, Jerry Rebus, then Shanley and his two guards, then others, until a score of them were crowded in the room at the bottom, their flashlights illuminating the circular chamber, revealing ceiling-high metal cabinets, banks of button and dial-studded control panels, big keyboards. It was Shanley who found the lights and put them on. "'Powered from the central plant down below,' he said. The main cables are disguised as the grounding outlet. If this thing had been on when you put on the power, 
You'd have had an awful lot of power going nowhere, apparently." Rodney Maxwell was disappointed. I know this stuff looks awfully complex, but I'd have expected there to be more of it. Oh, I didn't get a chance to tell you about that. This is only the operating end, Con said. And then asked Shanley if there were inspection screens. When Shanley indicated them, he began putting them on. This is the real computer. They all gave the same view, with minor differences, long corridors ten feet wide, between solid banks of steel cabinets on either side. Kahn explained where they were, and added, "'Kurt and the rest of them were sitting here all this time wondering where Merlin was. It was all around them.' "'Well, how did you get up here?' Fawzi asked. "'We couldn't find anything from below.' "'No, you couldn't,' Shanley was amused. Watch this. It was so simple that nobody had ever guessed it. Below, back of the commander-in-chief's office, there was a closet, fifteen feet by twenty. They had found it empty, except for some bits of discarded office gear, and had used it as a catch-all for everything they wanted out of the way. Shanley went to where four thick steel columns rose from floor to ceiling in a rectangle around a heavy-duty lifter, pressing a button on a control box on one of them. The lifter, and the floor under it, rose, with a thick mass of vitrified rock underneath. The closet, full of the junk that had been thrown into it, followed. "'That's it,' he said. "'We just tore out the controls inside that and patched it up a little. There's a sheet of collapsium plate under the floor. Your scanner simply couldn't detect anything from below.' Confident that Merlin would decree its own destruction, Shanley gave his parole. The others accepted it. The newsmen were admitted to the circular operating room and encouraged to send out views and descriptions of everything. Then the lift controls were reinstalled, the lid was put back on top, and the only access to the room was through the office below. The entrance to this was always guarded by Zareff's soldiers or Brangwen's police. There were only a score of them who could be led in on the actual facts. For the most part, they were the same men who had been in Fawzi's office on the afternoon of Kahn's return, a year and a half ago. A few others, Anse Dawes, Jerry Rivas, and five computer men Kahn had trained on Koshai had to be trusted. Kahn insisted on letting Sylvie Jackmont in on the revised, awful truth about Merlin. They spent a lot of their time together, in Travis's office, for the most part sunk in dejection. They had finally found Merlin. Now they must lose it. They were trying to reconcile themselves and take comfort from the achievement, empty as it was. They could see no way out. If Merlin said that Merlin had to be destroyed, that was it. Merlin was infallible. Khan hated the thought of destroying that machine with his whole being, not because it was an infallible oracle, but because it was the climactic masterpiece of the science he had spent years studying. To destroy it was an even worse sacrilege to him than it was to the Merlinolators. And Rodney Maxwell was thinking of the public effects. What the Travis statement had started would be nothing by comparison. You know... We can keep the destruction of Merlin a secret, Kahn said. It'll take some work down at the power plant, but we can overload all the circuits and burn everything out at once. He turned to Shanley. I don't know why you people didn't think of that. Shanley looked at him in surprise. Why, now that you mention it, neither do I, he admitted. We just didn't. Then, Kahn continued, we can tinker up something in the operating room that'll turn out what will look like computation results. As far as anybody outside ourselves will know, Merlin will still be solving everybody's problems. We'll do like any fortune teller, tell the customer what he wants to believe and keep him happy. More lies, lies without end. And now he'd have a machine to do his lying for him a dummy computer that wouldn't compute anything. And all he'd wanted, to begin with, 
had been a ship to haul some brandy to where they could get a fair price for it. Peace had returned. At first it had been a frightened and uneasy peace. The bluff, he hoped that was what it had been, by the Koshai colonists, had shocked everybody into momentary inaction. In the twenty-four hours that had followed, the forces of sanity and order had gotten control again. Merlin existed and had been found. As for Travis's statement, the old general had been bound by a wartime oath of secrecy to deny Merlin's existence. The majority relaxed, ashamed of their hysterical reaction. As for the cybernarchists and Armageddonists and human supremacy leaguers, the government and private police, vastly augmented by volunteers, speedily rounded up the leaders. Their followers dispersed, realizing that Merlin was nothing but a lot of dials and buttons, and interestedly watching the broadcast views of it. The banks were still closed, but discreet backdoor withdrawals were permitted to keep business going. So was the stock exchange, but word was going around the brokerage offices that Tri-System Investments was in the market for a long list of securities. Nobody was willing to do anything that might upset the precarious balance. Everybody was talking about the bright future, when Merlin would guide Potem to even greater and more splendid prosperity. Khan's father and sister flew to Litchfield. Flora stayed with her mother, and Rodney Maxwell returned to Force Command, shaking his head gravely. "'She's still unconscious, Khan,' he said. She just lies there, barely breathing. The doctors don't know. I wish Wade hadn't gone on the ship. The price of what he had wanted to do was becoming unendurably high for Khan. They ran off the computations Merlin had made forty years before and rechecked them. There had been no error. The Terran Federation, overextended, had been cracking for a century before the war. The strain of that conflict had started an irreversible breakup. Two centuries for the Federation as such. At most, another century of irregular trade and occasional war between independent planets. Galaxy full of human populated planets as poor as Poitem at its worst. Or, aware of the future, sudden outbursts of desperate violence, then anarchy and barbarism. It took a long time to set up the new computation. Forty years of history for almost five hundred planets had to be abstracted and summarized, and translated from verbal symbols to the electromathematical language of computers and fed in. Khan and Sylvie and General Shanley and the three men and two women Khan had taught on Koshai worked and rested briefly and worked again. Finally, it was finished. General, you're the oldest Merlin hand, Khan said, gesturing to the red button at the main control panel. You do it. You do it, Khan. None of us would be here except for you. Thank you, General. He pressed the button. They all stood silently watching the output slot. Even a positronic computer does not work instantaneously. Nothing does. Khan took his eyes from the slot from which the tape would come and watched the second hand of the clock above it. The wait didn't seem like hours to him. It only seemed like seventy-five seconds that way. Then the bell rang and the tape began coming out. It took another hour and a half of button-punching. The Braille-like symbols on the tape had to be retranslated, and even Merlin couldn't do that for itself. Merlin didn't think in human terms. It was the same as before. In ignorance, the peoples of the Federation worlds would go on, striving to keep things running until they wore out, and then sinking into apathetic acceptance. Deprived of hope, they would turn to frantic violence and smash everything they most wanted to preserve. Khan pushed another button. The second information request went in. 
what is the best course to be followed under these conditions by the people of Poitem? It had taken some time to phrase that in symbols a computer would find comprehensible. The answer, at great length, emerged in two minutes, eight seconds. Retranslating it took five hours. In the beginning, and for the first ten years, it was, almost item for item, the Maxwell Plan. Export trade, specialized in luxury goods, brandies and wines, tobacco, a long list of other exportable commodities, and optimum markets. Reopening of industrial plants, establishment of new industries, attainment of economic self-sufficiency, cultural self-sufficiency, establishment of universities, institutes of technology, research laboratories. Then the Maxwell Plan became the Merlin Plan. The breakup of the Federation was a fact that entered into the computation. Build-up of military strength to resist aggression by other planetary governments, defense of the Gartner Tri-System, lists of possible aggressor planets, revival of interstellar communications and trade, expeditions, conquest and re-education of natives. We can't begin to handle this without Merlin, Khan said. If that means blowing up the Federation, let it blow. We'll start a new one here. No, if there's a general, violent collapse of the Federation, it'll spread to Poitem, Shanley told him. Let's ask Merlin the big question. Merlin took a good five minutes to work that one out. The question had to include a full description of Merlin, and a statement of the information which must be kept secret. The answer was even more lengthy, but it was summed up in the first word. Falsification. "'So Merlin's got to be a liar, too, along with the rest of us?' Sylvie cried. "'Con, you've corrupted his morals!' The rest of it was false data which must be taped in, and lists of corrections which must be made in evaluating any computation into which such data might enter. There was also a statement that, after fifty years, suppression of the truth and circulation of falsely optimistic statements about the Federation would no longer have any importance. "'Well, that's it,' Kahn said. Merlin thought himself out of a death sentence. They crowded into the lift and went down to the office below. Everybody who knew what had been going on upstairs was there. Most of them were nursing drinks. Almost everybody was smoking. All of them were silent, until Judge Ledoux took his cigar from his mouth. "'Has the jury reached a verdict?' he asked, clinging with courtroom formality to his self-control. "'Yes, Your Honor. We find the defendant, Merlin, not guilty as charged. In the uproar his words released, Rodney Maxwell got to his feet and came quickly to Con. Flora called just a while ago. Your mother is conscious. She's asking for us. Flora says she seems perfectly normal. We'll go right away. Take a recon car. General, will you explain things till I get back? Sylvie, do you want to come with us? Chapter 22 It was autumn again, the second autumn since he had landed from the city of Asgard at Storsunda and taken the Countess Dorothy home to Litchfield. Again the fields were bare and brown, all up and down the Gordon Valley the melons were harvested and the wine-pressing was ready to start. The house was crowded today. All top-level Litchfield seemed to have turned out, and there were guests from Storsunda and even a few who had made the trip from Koshai to be there. Simon McQuart, the president of Koshai Tech. Khan could always remember him in the screen, threatening a whole planet with devastation. Luther Chen Wong, the chief executive of Koshai Colony. Clyde Nichols, the president of Koshai Airlines. He almost bumped into Eve's Jackmont, coming in from the hall. Jackmont's beard had been trimmed down to a small imperial, and he was wearing the uniform of Tri-System and Interstellar Space Lines, nothing at all like a Federation Space Navy uniform. He was laughing about something. 
He threw an arm over Khan's shoulder, and they went into the front parlor together. "'Oh, Gehenna of a big crop!' he heard Clem Zareff's voice chuckling happily above the babble in the room. "'You wouldn't believe it! Why, we had to build six new vats!' The thin-faced, white-haired man in the chair beside him said something. Mike Shanley and Clem Zareff, old enemies, were now fast friends. Shanley had come in from Force Command with Khan that morning. He had stayed on Poitam as nominal head of Project Merlin, and intended to remain there for the rest of his life. "'Oh, there aren't any more farm tramps,' Zareff replied. "'Everybody's getting factory jobs off-planet. I have an awful time getting help, and what I can get won't work for less than ten sols a day. Why, they're even organizing a union.' There were feminine shrieks from across the room, and a stampede. The house-cleaning robot had come in, running its vacuum-cleaning hose around and brandishing its mops. He saw his mother break away from a group of older ladies and shout, "'Oscar!' The robot stopped dead. "'Yeshem?' a voice came out of it, Sheshan accented. "'Get out!' his mother commanded. "'Go to the kitchen. Stay there!' "'Yeshem!' The robot floated out the door to the hall. His mother rejoined her friends, probably telling them for the thousandth time that her boy Khan fixed up the sound receptors and voice for Oscar, or harping on how Khan had been telling everybody the truth all along and people wouldn't believe him. Sylvie came up to him and caught his arm. "'Come on, Khan. They're going to start the rehearsal,' she said. They've been going to start it for an hour, her father told her. Well, they're really going to start it now. All right, you two run along, Eves Jackmont said. And you'd better start rehearsing for your own wedding before long. The Genji will be ready to hype her out in another month, and I don't want to be at space when my only daughter gets married. They pushed through the crowd, dragging Khan's mother with them toward the big living room beyond. On the way, Mrs. Maxwell stopped to try to drag Judge Ledoux out of a chair. "'Judge, the rehearsal is starting. They can't do it without you.' Ledoux clung to his chair. "'They daren't do it with me, Mrs. Maxwell. If I get into it, it won't be a rehearsal. They'll be really married, and then there won't be any point in having a wedding tomorrow.' "'Oh, Morgan,' Con called across the room to Gatworth, You've just been appointed temporary judge for the wedding rehearsal. There was a big crowd around Wade Lucas in the next room. He was telling them about the voyage to Baldur, from which he had returned, and the one to Ermansul with a cargo of arms, machine tools, and contragravity vehicles on which he and his bride would go for their honeymoon. There was another crowd around Flora. She was telling them about the new fashions on Baldur, which had been brought back on the Ouroboros too. "'Where's your father?' his mother was asking him. "'He has to rehearse giving the bride away.' "'Probably in his office. I'll go get him.' "'You'll get into an argument with somebody and forget to come back,' his mother said. "'Sylvie, you go with him and bring both of them back.' "'When'll we have our wedding, Sylvie?' he asked as they went off together. "'Well, before Dad goes to Aditya with the Genji. That'll have to be in a month.' Two weeks?' That ought to be plenty of time to get ready, and let people recover from this one. Everybody's here now. Let's make it a double wedding tomorrow, she suggested. He hadn't been prepared for that. Well, I hadn't expected... Sure. Good idea, he agreed. There was a crowd in Rodney Maxwell's little office, Fozzie and some others, and some Storsenda people. One of the latter was vociferating... Jake Vykoven's no good, and he never was any good. Well, you have to admit, if he hadn't ordered the banks and the stock exchange closed that time, we'd have had a horrible panic. Admit nothing of the kind. Jethro, you were there, and you'll bear me out. About a dozen of us were at Executive Palace for hours, bullying him into that. Why, we almost had to twist one of his arms while he was signing the order with the other and now he has the gall to run for re-election on the strength of his heroic actions at the time of the Travis hoax? 
I know who we want for president, another Storsund man exclaimed. He's right here in this room. Yes, Rodney Maxwell almost bellowed before the other man could say anything else. Here he is. He grabbed Kurt Fawzi by the arm and yanked him to his feet. Here's the man most responsible for finding Merlin, the man who first suggested sending my son Khan to Terra to school, the man who, more than anyone else, devoted his life to the search for Merlin, the man whose inextinguishable faith and indomitable courage kept that search alive through its darkest hours. Everybody, get a drink. A toast to our next president, Kurt Fawzi. Khan was sure he heard his father add, Goo, what a narrow escape. Then he and Sylvie began chanting in unison, We want Fawzi! We want Fawzi! 